The Absolute at Large by Karel Chopek Translated by David Wiley Performed by Francis Bax Chapter 18 Nighttime in the Editing Room The People's Friend had a wider circulation than any other Catholic or popular journal, but the editorial staff was nonetheless very limited which is why at half-past nine in the evening the only people in the office were the night editor, Mr. Koshkal, God knows why night editors always smell so strongly of pipe tobacco, and Father Yost, whistling through his teeth as he wrote the leader article for the following day. Just then, Mr. Novotny, the typesetter, came in with some fresh proofs in his hand. What about this leader, then? What about this leader? he growled. How soon can we set it? Father Yost stopped whistling. Very soon now, Mr. Novotny, he said hurriedly. There's one word, though, I need to think of first. Have we already had machine from hell? Two days ago. Uh Aha. And have we had vicious scheme? That, too. Villainous trick? We use that one today. Godless invention. At least six times, said Koshkal. Oh, that's a pity, said Father Yost with a sigh. I do think we could have put our ideas to better use. How do you like today's leader, Mr. Novotny? It's good, the typesetter replied. But we need to get it into print. You'll have it right away, Father Yost told him. I think they were quite satisfied with the early issue upstairs. His Grace the Bishop will come down, you'll see. Yost, he'll say. A nice piece of invective, Yost, he'll say. Have we already had insane funfair? We have. Oh, that's a pity. We'll have to put some new batteries in and hurry. His Grace did tell me we would have to hurry. Everything has its time, but we don't have eternity. Mr. Novotny, can you think of a suitable phrase? How about malicious folly or perverse malevolence? That will be all right, said Father Yost with relief. Where do you get such good ideas, Mr. Novotny? From old copies of the People's Friend. But this leader, Father, it won't be long now, just wait a little while. The malicious folly and perverse malevolence shown by members of some circles who, with their worship of Baal, pollute the pure waters that flow from the rock of St. Peter. Ah, yes, soon be ready. Rock of St. Peter, pollute the pure waters, yes, and put in their place the golden calf that serves the devil or the absolute. Have you got that leader yet? came a voice from the doorway. Praise the Lord, it's his grace, Father Yost exclaimed. Have you got that leader yet? Consecrating Bishop Linda repeated as he strode into the room. And who the hell wrote that leader in the early edition? You made a right mess of things there. What bloody fool wrote that? The, that was me, Father Yost stuttered. Your your grace, he cowered. I I only thought... It's not your job to think, Bishop Linda snarled as sparks of light reflected horribly from his glasses. Just look at this, he said, as he crumpled an early copy of the People's Friend in his fist and threw it down at Father Yost. He only thought. Look at him. He only thought. Why didn't you phone and ask? You should have asked what you were supposed to write. And what about you, Koshkal? What were you thinking of, letting this go to print? You only thought two, did you, Novotny? Yes, sir, the typesetter groaned, his knees shaking. Why did you put this into print? You only thought two, I suppose. Uh, no, sir, the typesetter protested. I just have to set whatever I'm given, sir. No one has to do anything unless I tell them to, the bishop declared conclusively. Yosht, sit down and read this rubbish you put out this morning. Go on, read. The public in this country... Father Yost read with tremulous voice. The public in this country has long been disturbed by uh, villainous trick. What's that? Villainous trick, your grace? Father Yost groaned. I, uh, I only thought I, I can see now that what? Maybe that was a little bit strong villainous trick. I should say it was a bit strong. Carry on reading. Villainous trick with what they call the absolute, that... Freemasons, Jews, and other progressives used to fool the world. It has been scientifically proven... Well, fancy that, Yost! the bishop shouted. Something's been scientifically proven. Carry on reading! Scientifically proven, stuttered poor Father Yost, that this so-called absolute is just a swindle perpetrated by unbelievers, just as attempts by the media... That's enough now, Father Yost, said the consecrating bishop, suddenly becoming gentle. Write down this leader. It has been scientifically proven. Got that so far? Proven that I, Father Yost, am an ass, a noodle, an incompetent. Got that, have you? 
Yes, Your Grace, whispered the humiliated Father Yost. Please carry on, sir. Throw that in the bin, son, the bishop said, and see if you can get your stupid head around this. Have you seen today's papers? Yes, Your Gr- I'm not so sure about that. This morning, Father Yost, the first publication to come out was written by the monists. According to them, the absolute is that single entity that the monists have always acknowledged as the true God, and so the cult of the absolute is perfectly in accord with their teachings. Read it, have you? I have re- And the Freemasons, too. They tell their members they should do what they can to encourage and develop the absolute. Read it? I- And at the Lutheran Synod, Superintendent Martins gave a five-hour-long speech proving that the absolute was identical with God the Provider. Read that, have you? I did re- And at the Seventh International, the Russian delegate, Peruskin Rebenfeld, urged that Comrade God should be honored because he had shown his sympathy for the working man by going into the factories with him. He adds that we should offer thanks to the Supreme Comrade for deciding to go to work himself instead of exploiting the workers. He proposes there should be a general strike in all his factories as a sign of solidarity, at least until a secret meeting of the Presidium cancelled the proposal because it wasn't the right time. Read that, did you? I d- In the end, they passed a resolution that the absolute is the exclusive property of the working classes, and the bourgeoisie have no right to praise him or to benefit from any of his miracles. They resolved to cultivate the cult of the absolute for the workers, and to build up a secret stock of weapons, just in case the capitalists try to exploit the absolute for themselves. Did you read that? Yes, your g- There's been a speech by the free thinkers, a publication by the Salvation Army, a communique from the Theosophical Society Adjar, an open letter addressed to the absolute and signed by the Small Landowners Association, a declaration by the Society of Carousel Owners signed by its president, J. Binder, a special edition of The Undertaker's Magazine, and a special edition of Voices from the Underworld, The Anabaptist Reader, and The Abstinent. Read all of this, have you? Yes, yes. So, my son, you can see that everyone everywhere is celebrating the absolute and claiming it for themselves, bestowing honors on it and making wonderful offers to it, making it an honorary member of theirs and saying it's their benefactor, their protector, their god, and I don't know what else. Meanwhile here, there's some lunatic Father Yost, our very own Father Yost, if you please, our own little Father Yost, who goes round shouting that it's all a big con trick and scientifically proven swindle. You've really dropped us in it, for Christ's sake! But, Your Grace, I have been ordered to... to write against... against these apparitions. So you had, the consecrating bishop interrupted him sternly. But how the hell didn't you see the situation had changed? Yosht, the bishop shouted as he stood erect. Our churches are empty, and their flocks are running to the absolute. Are you too bloody stupid to see that if we want to keep our flocks for ourselves, we need to get the absolute on our side? We need to get atomic carburetors in all our churches. But you, your reverence, that's something you can't understand. Just remember this. The absolute has to be working for us. It has to be something we own. Id est something we own and no one else does. Capisces me, Fili? Capisco, Father Yost whispered. Deo gratias! Now, Yost, what you do now is you turn right around. You're going to write a nice little leader for us. You're going to tell everyone that the Holy Congregation hears the wishes of them that have faith and have accepted the absolute into the bosom of the church. No vote any. Here's an apostolic decree dealing with the matter. Get it on the front page. Large and heavy print. Koshkal, write something for the city pages that G. H. Bondi is taking holy baptism from the Supreme Pastor on Sunday, and that we're delighted to have him. Understand? And Yosht, little Yosht, sit down and start writing. Wait, you'll need some kind of strong words for the opening. Yes, Your Grace, perhaps something like malicious folly and perverse malevolence shown by members of some circles? Good. Now write this. 
The malicious folly and perverse malevolence shown by members of some circles has been attempting to lead our people along the wrong path for many months now. These heretics have been declaring publicly that the Absolute is something other than the one true God to which we have been praying since we were children. Got that? Praying to with the faith of a child. Faith and love of a child. Got that? Next. Chapter 19, The Canonization Process I'm sure you will understand that accepting the Absolute into the bosom of the Church was, in the circumstances, quite surprising. It was achieved simply by papal edict, and the College of Cardinals, faced with a fait accompli, was left with nothing more to decide than whether the Absolute should be given holy baptism. It was decided not to take this step. Baptism of God was, after all, a clear part of church tradition, viz. John the Baptist, but it would be necessary for the baptized to be present. And not only would he need to be present, but there was also the politically sensitive question of what authority would be the Absolute's Godfather. So the Holy Congregation decided to recommend that, at the next pontifical mass, the Holy Father should pray for a new wing of the church, which was created with great celebration. It also became church doctrine to acknowledge baptism by holiness, by service, and by honorable deeds, as well as baptism by sacrament and by blood. In other words, three days before the edict was issued, the Pope granted another audience with Mr. G. H. Bondi, who had already spent 40 hours in discussion with the papal secretary, Monsignor Culotti. A simplified procedure was introduced to beatify the absolute by super cultu immemorabili, an acknowledgment of his holiness, and at almost the same time an orderly but accelerated procedure was implemented to canonize the now blessed absolute. There was, of course, another important difference in that the absolute was not declared a saint, but declared God. A deification commission was appointed, made up of members of the best teachers and pastors the church had to offer. Procurator Day was the famous Archbishop of Venice, Cardinal Dr. Varesi, and the Advocatus Diaboli was Monsignor Culati. Cardinal Varese cited 17,000 testimonies of miracles performed by the Absolute, almost all of them signed by cardinals, patriarchs, primates, bishops, princes of the church, archbishops, representatives of orders, and abbots. Each testimony was supported by appendices containing confirmation of medical expertise, expert appraisal, opinions from professors of natural science, technology, and economics, and finally concluded with eyewitnesses' signatures, all properly and legally documented by a commissioner for oaths. As the Monsignor explained, these 17,000 documents showed just a tiny fraction of the miracles actually performed by the Absolute, which, according to conservative estimates, was now already well over 30 million. The Procurator Day also produced a wide range of expert appraisals from the best scientific specialists in the world. Professor Gardien, for instance, rector of the Faculty of Medicine in Paris, finished a thorough analysis by saying, Many of the cases presented to us for examination were, from a medical point of view, entirely without hope, and could not be cured in any way known to science. Paralysis, cancer of the throat, blindness after both eyes were surgically removed, disability resulting from both lower limbs having been removed, death caused by severance of the head from the body, strangulation with the victim left hanging for two days, etc., with this in mind, the medical faculty at the Sorbonne concludes that attributing these healings to a miracle, as they call it, can only be the result of a complete lack of knowledge of anatomical and pathological conditions, a lack of clinical experience, and total unfamiliarity with medical practice. On the other hand, and this is not a possibility we would wish to exclude, they may have been the work of higher forces unlimited by the laws of nature or any knowledge of them. Professor Meadow, a psychologist at Glasgow, wrote, it is clear that these incidents could not have taken place without the involvement of a thinking being, capable of association, memory, and even logical judgment, a being which carries out these mental operations without the means of a brain or nervous system. This offers splendid confirmation of my crushing critique of Professor Mayer, in which I put forward the idea of psychophysical parallelism. I assert that the so-called absolute is a thinking being, possessed of consciousness and intelligence, albeit of a sort little researched by science so far. Professor Lupin at the Brno Institute of Technology wrote, Considering its productive capacity, the absolute is a force deserving of our highest deference. Villebald, the famous chemist at Tübingen, wrote, 
The absolute has all the conditions needed for existence and scientific development, as it clearly meets all the conditions of Einstein's theory of relativity. The chronicler will not bother you any further with the expert appraisals contributed by the world's scientific authorities, and it's all been published by the Vatican anyway. The canonization process continued at high speed, and an assembly of dogmatists and exegesists prepared a paper based on the writings of the founding fathers of the Church that showed that the absolute was identical with the third person of God. But before the deification of God could be celebrated, the Patriarch of Istanbul declared, as head of the Eastern Church, the identity of the Absolute was the first person of God, the Creator. The opinion was clearly heretical, but it was adopted by certain old-school Catholics, the circumcised Christians of the Church in Ethiopia, the Swiss Evangelicals, Conconformists, and some of the larger American sects, with the result that a lively theological debate flared up. As for the Jews, a secret doctrine began to spread among them claiming that the Absolute was the ancient god Baal. Liberal Jews acknowledged quite openly that in that case they were worshippers of Baal. Two thousand delegates of free thinkers met in Basel where the Absolute was declared their god. They began an incredibly fierce diatribe against priests of all denominations who, as the resolution put it, wished to exploit the god of science and drag it into the filthy cage of church dogmas and priestly sophistries where it will be left to starve. God, however, visible to every progressive modern thinker, will have nothing to do with the medieval nonsense of these Pharisees. His domain will permit no thought but free thought. Only the Congress of Basel is authorized to set the beliefs and rituals around free religion. About the same time, the Union of Monists in Germany laid the foundation stone for the Cathedral of God the Atomic in Leipzig. The event was one of festival and celebration, but there were some scuffles in which 16 people were injured, and Lutgen, the famous physicist, had his glasses broken. By the way, that autumn some religious revelations also took place in Belgian Congo and French Senegambia. With no forewarning, a number of Negroes attacked and ate some missionaries and began to bow down to some new idols which they called Otto or Ololto. It turned out later that these were atomic motors and that German officers and agents had had a hand in the matter. In Arabia, during the outburst of Islamic passion that erupted in Mecca in December of that year, it was shown that a number of French emissaries had hidden 20 light atomic motors near the Kaaba. The resulting riots of Mohammedans in Egypt and Tripoli and the massacres in Arabia cost the lives of around 30,000 Europeans. The final deification of the Absolute took place in Rome on the 12th of December. 7,000 priests carrying lighted candles accompanied the Holy Father into St. Peter's Cathedral, where a 12-ton carburetor had been installed behind the main altar, donated to the Holy See by MEAS. The ceremony lasted five hours, and 2,000 believers and onlookers were crushed to death. Exactly at midday, the Pope proclaimed, In nomine Dei Deus, and at that moment all the bells in all the Catholic churches in all the world rang out in joy. All the bishops and all the priests turned away from their altars and declared to the believers, Habemus Deum. This recording is under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-Alike License. Music was composed by Uzair Hajibayov and performed by the United States Navy Band. The book was written by Karel Chopek, translated by David Wiley, and performed by Francis Bass.